Welcome to the Dear NICU Mama podcast. This podcast is a safe place to connect with other NICU moms by listening to interviews with trauma-informed medical and maternal mental health experts, remarkable stories from the NICU, and intentional roundtable conversations. Our hope is that you feel like you're sitting across the table from another NICU sister and feel seen and validated in your experience. No matter where you are on your healing journey, this podcast is here to remind you that you are not alone. Welcome to the Sisterhood. Hello, beautiful mamas, and welcome back to the Dear Nikki Mama podcast. I am like shaking with excitement over here. I have been so pumped about this episode. I cannot wait to get into it. Aisha, how are you feeling? I am equally as excited. I had not met our guest before, but I had listened to all the podcasts you and Martha had done with her throughout, you know, <laughs> the lifespan of Dear Nikki Mama podcast, and I'm like, I feel a little starstruck, to be honest. So, <laughs> Honestly, same. Every time this guest is on here, I stare at her beautiful hair and her perfect skin. And then she starts talking and I'm like, oh my gosh, it, as if it couldn't get any better. She's also smart and like brilliant and beautiful all in one thing. So we are so, so, so excited to have the beloved Parja Deshpande back. Hello, Parja. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> It's like 10 degrees hotter in here than it was five seconds ago. Our intros with you always get a little out of hand. I'm like, I could just keep going on and on and on. We are so grateful to have you and just so excited to hear about all of the new things in your career and in your business of supporting moms and also for today's topic. So... Dear Nikoma podcast listeners, if you are um, a veteran listener to the podcast or a longtime listener, you will know this voice and you will know this woman because we've had her on quite a few times. But I can confidently say that every time we've had you on here, there's been this light bulb moment, um, whether it was close to my NICU journey or years after when you share about these topics that sometimes just seem like, oh, that wouldn't be connected to my trauma or that wouldn't be related to my birth trauma. The wisdom that you share really brings it into perspective and ultimately eliminates a lot of shame surrounding these topics. And so I'm so grateful to have you back here today. And if you haven't heard our episodes with her, make sure to look back on the archives and listen to some of those because we cover some really, really great topics. But Parsha, can we first just have you start? You have had a really exciting past year. You launched a whole new kind of cohort for families that are experiencing NICU trauma, birth trauma, infertility. And so I would love for you to just take a moment and share about your recent venture and all about Ruvel. Absolutely. I'm so excited. It's like, hey, meet my new baby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so Ruvel uh, is, is, I think, the amalgamation of everything. It, it was, mm -hmm. it was the the thing that i couldn't see five years ago but was gestating over these five years mm -hmm. um you know yeah. it's ruvel in and of itself the the technical definition i guess that we're giving is it's the only truly trauma-informed wellness company dedicated specifically to improving high-risk pregnancy outcomes and ending prematurity so parents can pass on generational health we do that through oh, our somatic practices our neurosensory practices and our guidance through navigating healthcare. But I think it's so much more than that. I think it's mm -hmm. it's learning how to be on a journey that is so unfairly complicated in a way that retains who you are, who you want to be, so that you can create the family that you're dreaming of. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it came to be finally over these last few months because I have had so much fun working with my private clients and I still do work with clients, but there's a limit to how much I can do individually. And I know that there is so much need in this world, this high, I'm calling it the high risk pregnancy journey, but what I really mean is including infertility, going through loss, even through the NICU, even after birth trauma or medical trauma, and of course, prematurity, there's so much need and there's just not enough light shed on it. You know, you mm -hmm. know, as mm -hmm. well as I do, why are we still a footnote? Mm -hmm. And so I took everything, everything that I have learned from working with all of my private clients from around the world. And I put it into this under this umbrella that we're calling Ruvel now mm -hmm. and through our products and in our shop 
and through our services in our private members club, you get everything. And we want to be that one-stop shop where when you're on this complicated journey, you can turn to Ruvel and go, I'm going to get what I need when I come here. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what's out in the world now. And I'm so excited about it. And I, I can't wait to share it with more and more and more people because it's totally right. what I wanted. It's totally yeah. what I needed and still isn't there. And therefore, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> you made it. That's awesome. Well, and we're so grateful that you made it because... Mm-hmm. I remember sometimes after our even like podcast with you or events we've done with you, one of the main questions is, well, how can I work with you? Mm -hmm. And you're one person. (laughs) And so I love that this is a resource for moms who want to access the very important work that you do, but, um, and, and can do that because it, it opens you a little bit more to work with more people. And so I'm really excited that it's a resource for Nikki moms like myself and moms who have questions about building their family after high risk pregnancy and prematurity. And so I just think it's so invaluable. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the name and how you came up with it? I was just going to ask that. I'm like, yes. I have a fun question. I want to know about the name. <laughs> uh, it was really funny. I should show you my notes. It was like a brain dump of every possible combination of letters and numbers <laughs> and sounds. Yeah, um, I I wanted something that would that would have special meaning. I wanted something mm-hmm. that was connected to my background. I am of Indian origin. I wanted something that people would remember and is easy to say. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. you yep. combine all of that together, and uh, Ruvel is an amalgamation of a few different words that really just describe our path on this earth together towards lightness. And you put mm. some of the Sanskrit words together with the Eng- the German word L, because it sounds beautiful, uh, mm-hmm. and also means light. And you, you get um, Ruvel, which means our, our path towards lightness. Oh, that's so, so beautiful. beautiful. Thank I love you. that. <laughs> I love that. So good. Well, we are incredibly proud of you and really excited to have this as a resource to link families to. And so we will make sure in the show notes to link the ways to connect with you and Ravel. And then at the end of the episode, we'll talk about a little fun, exciting collaboration. So um, thank you for kicking that off by just sharing more about you and the work that you do. But um, I, if you guys aren't subscribers to the Ravel um email subscribe list, you got to be because she is constantly sharing wisdom in those emails and things that I just wouldn't think of that I'm like, oh, this is really fascinating. And you recently sent out an email called overcoming indecision after fertility, a high risk pregnancy, loss or birth trauma. And of course, that subject line kind of caught my attention because I was like, okay, indecisiveness can be linked to all of these things? Okay, I want to <laughs> chat and learn about this. And so um, Aisha and I had a chance to really look through this article and we immediately knew like, this is the topic that mm-hmm. we want to talk about. Mm-hmm. And especially for moms in our community, but I would love to know why you thought that this would be an important topic and what kind of compelled you to write about it in your article. I think it was in that article I'd shared the example, right, of the sandwich or of lunch. Um, yeah. That's a moment, I'll tell the story here too, it, that's a moment that really sticks out for me of the many moments that we had on our NICU journey. I remember that was a very profound one because I went, in, I'm, I'm having like two parallel conversations in my head. One is of the indecisiveness and I'll describe that in a moment. And the other is, what exactly is wrong with me that I cannot answer this question? <laughs> and like having these two experiences. so. It was just a few days after my son was born. For those of you who aren't familiar with my story, my son was born extremely preterm. He was a 24-weeker. And I had already been discharged from the hospital, so he was a a few days old, less probably less than a week, but a few days old. And we're sitting in, I can still picture it like it's happening right now. We're sitting in the dining room. I'm sitting at the head of the table. I've got both my parents on either side of me sitting there. I've got my husband in the kitchen and he asks me, what do you want for lunch? And I cannot, I don't have the words to describe how I didn't have the words to answer that Mm -hmm. question. You know what I mean? It was like Mm -hmm. blank everything. Like I had no access to language. I didn't know how, I don't even, I couldn't even begin 
to think about how to conceptualize that question. It was like they're the mm-hmm. anchor point, right? Like when, mm-hmm. if I ask you that right now, what do you want for lunch? Well, you kind of have this framework in your head of what is lunch and what are my mm-hmm. general options here, right? I had none of that. Mm-hmm. And I remember just sitting there and going, really, why is this question of all questions, which has no bearing on anything whatsoever while my son's life hangs in the balance, I can't answer it. What happened to me that I can't answer it? And to this day, that is a moment that still sticks with me, right? I can I can picture it. I can put myself back in that moment. And I know that it's not just immediately after the birth that this happens. I then have seen it happen over and over and over with my private clients and in our community where baby was born six months ago, a year ago, three years ago. I have heard it from somebody who worked with me where their preterm child was born 15 years ago. And she said, I still struggle with indecision and nobody's been able to figure out why. Hmm. And the worst part about it, and this is why I wanted to share it, is we internalize the reason. I just Mm -hmm. said it a few moments ago. What's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. Why am I like this? Why is my brain not working? We Mm -hmm. assume that it's us when what it actually is is a very predictable and expected response when we are constantly living in an activated threat cycle. And one of the things I notice when I work with my clients and what we're bringing to Ruvel is this idea of depathologizing that and going, it's not you. You're not the problem. There's nothing wrong with you. Let's understand why this is happening so that we can understand what to do next. Yeah. That, that is, that's so powerful because as you were even telling that story, that internalization is something that definitely like stood out to me too because it is something that I've struggled with um and have always just said it just it must be me like I don't see my husband struggling with this and and I'm always the one that's like it feels like I'm stuck is what it feels like so when I read your article and I was reading about it being a signal that my body is giving me and sending me it felt like, wow, I want to know more about this. And there was two feelings of like, the first one being, how can it be that I have in a in a way gotten so far away from knowing myself, like that disconnection. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was this, this feeling of sadness over that, that there is this disconnect. Um, but then just a lot of curiosity too. I wanted to know more. I wanted to say, how can I repair that? I want to be able to repair that, that line of communication that is so important, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I was wondering, could you kind of describe what that process is like? Absolutely. We think of it like a signal, like you said, it's a signal because it's telling us what our body, what is it capable of doing right now, right? So an example not related to this, just to give us an, a visual here is, let's say we've all been there. We have not had a good night's sleep. And so the next morning you think about, okay, every morning at 6.30, I get up and I work out. And then you're on three hours of sleep. What does mm-hmm. 6.30 feel like the next morning? It <laughs> feels so awful. And you, mm-hmm. your body feels heavy and sometimes you're, it's hurting and you're you know, everything is just kind of down and low and hard, right? Mm -hmm. That's a signal from our body. We don't have the energy to do what we are planning to do. Similarly, when our stomach grumbles, that is a signal from our body that it is time to replenish nutrients because we, we, it is, it is time we're hungry, right? We need sustenance. We need food. We don't judge ourselves for being hungry, right? We don't sit here with this grumbling stomach and go, God, why are you like this? Why, why is this <laughs> happening? And it's the same thing. That's kind of why I framed it as a signal because this is also a signal. What this mm-hmm. is signifying is what state is my body in right now that is making, a, make, that is making it difficult to make a decision, mm-hmm. right? So it's not, there's something wrong with me. It's not, Mm -hmm. I don't have access to this ability or this skill that I used to be so good at and now suddenly has disappeared. Mm -hmm. It's, 
telling me something about the state that my body is in. Grumbling yeah. stomach, I'm hungry, can't make a decision. What does that mean? Now, very mm -hmm. often, if we look at this from a stress physiology perspective, very often what that means is we are in an active threat state. When we're in an active threat state, we are not supposed to be able to make decisions. We're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. There is actual blood flow that is changed in our brains that make it difficult, if not impossible, to make complex decisions. Yeah. And that's what our body is telling us. I just love anything you share. Seriously. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, yeah, like, preach, that makes preach. a lot more sense. <laughs> well, and I don't know, you know, maybe back to your sandwich story a little bit about lunch. I think sometimes, especially early on in the NICU, like the weight of deciding what type of if if you're comfortable doing um, a blood transfusion for your baby yeah. in a sandwich feel like the same amount yes. of weight. Yes. And it's really hard to differentiate. So like I just remember feeling like I just had to decide what level of care I wanted for my child and now I'm having to decide lunch and those two things feel like the same significance even though I know they're not yeah. um and that can just be like a really debilitating feeling and also when you were sharing it reminded me a lot of when people ask you what do you need mm -hmm. or how can I help you yeah. I was like figure out how to help me yeah pick out my lunch I don't know <laughs> you know I think that's why the most practical things are the most helpful because you're helping eliminate those decisions yes. because you're making these like life huge decisions for your child at the same time trying to decide what to have for lunch. Yeah. And so I wonder if you could chat then, you know, going to those threat state patterns because you have a quiz um, in this email and on your website and we'll make sure to link that of just kind of helping you identify which ones you might be operating in. But would you be willing to just talk us through the different types that you, you see most often and, and what those typically look like? Yeah, absolutely. There are three. These words are probably very familiar to your listeners right now. Fight, flight, and freeze, right? Fight mm -hmm. is, if we take our bear example again, as we always go to, fight is your body mobilizes in a way where it has assessed outside of conscious awareness that fighting pushing, moving head on assertiveness or aggression is the way to, to survive that threat. What that means is we often see people with tight hands, fatigued fingers, you see shoulder tightness, you see back aches, you see increased blood pressure, you see a lot of activation in your legs you uh, or arms, so you're restless, a lot of movement, right? Mm -hmm. Flight is your body has assessed outside of conscious awareness that getting away from the threat is the safest way to survive that threat. So there you see also a lot of increased blood pressure. See cardiovascular disease is high in people that are living in this state for a long time. Uh, you see a lot of restless legs, rest restless leg syndrome at night. You see a lot of leg bouncing up and down when they're sitting in a meeting mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you see blood flow changing to extremities and away from the core mm -hmm. in order to get you to move. These are people who you often might notice or you might be yourself going, you're called restless a lot. You're called anxious a lot. You're called, you can't sit still. I can't stop. I can't because your body is trying to get you to move, right? Mm -hmm. And then... Um, and we haven't even talked about the sensory parts of it. We'll get to that. Mm -hmm. And then freeze is when your body assesses outside of conscious awareness that the best way to survive this threat is to hide. Mm -hmm. That can also happen if you are in fight or flight for too long, because you can imagine we are not supposed to be in these threat states for very long. We cannot sustain it. We can do exceptionally superhuman things in very short bursts, right? You probably hear the story of the mother who can lift a car to, to get her child yeah. out. You can't do that for an hour, right? right. Yeah. And yet that's how we're living in our world. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. freeze is that state. Now, uh, and in that state, you find that your body wants to curl up. Your body wants to shrink. 
you want to get small you want to hide that's where you see people talking about i just can't get out of bed i want to hide under the covers you see a lot of actually neck and shoulder tension and tightness because the body really just wants to curl up in on itself and we don't let ourselves mm -hmm. do that because hashtag life we've got responsibilities, we've got to go to work, we've got to do these things. You can't sit there hiding through all yeah. that, right? right? But that's what the body really needs. It is not a relaxed state. It's called freeze. It sounds kind of like, oh, okay, well, you're just kind of there for a moment. But it actually, you take a lot of energy to actually mm -hmm. be in this immobile state, if you will. Mm -hmm. Immobile is a little bit of an exaggeration. It's not, you know, exactly that. What we find is that there's an in-between state between fight, flight, and freeze, called functional freeze, which is where most of us tend to be. We show mm -hmm. up to work. We show up for our responsibilities. We show up for birthday parties and baby showers. We put the smile on our face. Nobody can tell from the outside anything's going on. And yet inside, our body is, imagine, full foot on accelerator, full foot on brake. It is going, <laughs> it's working overtime to get us to be in these places that we need to be. Mm -hmm. That is where we see the very high incidence of chronic illness. We see a very high incidence of new diagnoses. I see very frequently with NICU moms, especially autoimmune diseases pop up. We see mm -hmm. chronic pain pop up. We see cardiovascular disease, diabetes, a lot of these things, all mm -hmm. related to the fact that our, we are pushing our bodies to do something that is not aligned with the state that we are in. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, when I share that, will go, well, what about fawn? Because you hear about fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. What about fawn? Mm -hmm. Fawn is not actually a threat state. It is a behavioral compensation or a behavioral learning, a learned behavior, where it's very similar to what we just talked about, functional freeze. Mm -hmm. You've got fight, flight, and freeze going at the same time, and your learned behavior is, I must mm -hmm. now also behave in a way to reduce conflict, to be yeah. mm -hmm. kind or compassionate or to, um, to, to have a relationship in a way that will keep me safe. So that's mm -hmm. why we stick with the, those three typically and functional freeze being um, not an official state, but it is also a, an experience that I, I find most, most people, when we look at the, the quiz results, actually, it is a, an overwhelming majority of people mm -hmm. are in that state right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet the data would be fascinating to see on your end of just mm -hmm. like where NICU moms or people who've experienced birth trauma and infertility find themselves. Yeah. Um, and I think it, you know, like we talk about big decisions in the NICU, but then as all of us know, we're making endless decisions as soon as we come home too. And then you start to ask yourself questions of, well, should we get pregnant? Because then it would look like this. And if we do this, or this, and it's just like the questions and it just sometimes feels like, yeah, it just feels easiest to just freeze and mm -hmm. like get through the day. But we're like, like almost like robots, like mm -hmm. we're here, but we're not really here. And like Aisha mentioned that sadness of just missing that connection with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so for moms who maybe take the quiz or who have identified already, like I am living in a a threat state or a threat state pattern, you know, what can be like a gentle way to begin to move through indecisiveness, whether, you know, maybe they're feeling paralyzed by basic decisions or big decisions. Like what is one gentle way they can just start to move through making decisions? I think the first thing that we've kind of talked about a little bit and danced around already is can you have compassion for yourself to understand why this is happening? Mm -hmm. right that if I were to go back to that lunch moment can I see it as not what is wrong with me I used I'm so good at making decisions I'm a very decisive person why can't I decide this can I can I flip that to say what does my body need right now because making this decision is a sign that I I need something Mm -hmm. right or what can I ask for from my loved ones and it might be can you decide for me which I think is what I ended mm -hmm. up yelling at my husband at. Like, yeah, just right. do it I don't want to mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah but can we can we have compassion can we ask a different question 
Can we have that compassion for ourselves to say, this is a sign that I can't do this right now. And that's not because I'm not capable of doing it. It's that I just need something else. It's like being hungry and then say, well, I'm going to go for a walk. I think that'll help. It's, it, there's just a mismatch, right, of need and what we're doing. And I think if we can get to that place of going, oh, oh, it's happening again. Oh, this is where I am right now. I'm fighting a bear. I'm running from a bear. I'm hiding from a bear. Mm -hmm. It puts into perspective than what we're asking ourselves to do. Now, mm -hmm. that's not to say we can't make those decisions because there are some decisions that have to be made, especially if you're mm -hmm. in the NICU, you're caring for somebody, whether it's a child mm -hmm. or um, even an elderly person, there are decisions that have to be made. Mm -hmm. I find that if you can have that compassion first, then you can ask yourself the next question of, what do I need in order to make this decision? Mm -hmm. What do I need in order to make that decision? Do I need a moment? Do I need mm -hmm. some silence? Do I need to go lie down first? Do I need to call somebody? Do I need a hug? Mm -hmm. There are small things that you can do. They're not going to cure, fix, whatever, any of the whole big picture, right. but it'll get you to the next moment. Mm. Right. I think that's something that, um, as you say it, it feels like such a simple, like, of course, right? And yet, I think it's a very common, um, hard step for a lot of us to take. But I think that just in you saying that, and I think hearing that as often as I can personally, that does like remind me like I am worthy of taking care of myself and my needs. Um, and so I think that, yeah, it's just, it's anytime I hear it, I am so grateful because I do know <laughs> that the more I hear it, the more I can internalize it and say, mm -hmm. yes, I, I can do this for myself as well. And it's not mm -hmm. taking away from anything else. I, I deserve it. So just thank you yeah. for that reminder too. I love that anytime we ask you for like, what's a thing, a box we can check? You're like, well, first <laughs> you have to be kind to yourself. Yes. And I'm like, oh, Dang I thought it. we could skip that part. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think as, or maybe this is just my personality, but I feel like I have a lot of friends similarly who it's, it's, it's more motivating to be motivated by shame than compassion. Yes. Mm -hmm. It can feel like a quicker motivator. Yes. It's like, well, if I shame myself, I'll I'll act on it because that feels that feels comfortable, right? If I offer compassion and kindness to myself, that feels like I'm just excusing my my indecisiveness mm -hmm. or I'm just like, you know. But if we skip over that self-compassion and that kindness, we actually don't move to the other side. We don't mm -hmm. walk to the other side. Um and so it's it's like this rewiring of like, oh, yeah, shame is not the most powerful motivator here mm -hmm. <laughs> or the most effective. I should say it is mm -hmm. a powerful motivator, but it's mm -hmm. not the most effective yep. compassion and kindness is and to extend that to ourselves. So thank you for always giving that reminder for us. Absolutely. Um, Could I add one thing there? Yes. Please. I think you both hit on something so important that it it sounds so simple. And then when you're in the moment no, nope, mm -hmm. no, nope, yeah. can't do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get so mad at myself. I'm going to shame myself. I'm going to be so mm -hmm. frustrated. Yeah. I'm going to disconnect, whatever it is that we do. And I, I, I want to remind everybody that's listening that if you're in that moment, when we go to those patterns where we shame ourselves to change what we're doing or to how we're being in the world, when we get mad at ourselves, what we are doing is maintaining ourselves in a threat state that we're familiar with mm -hmm. because our bodies will only do what is familiar over yeah. what is good for us always mm -hmm. yeah that's how mm -hmm. mammalian physiology works mm -hmm. familiar over what's good for us and so yeah. when you said rewire you're 100 percent right we are literally retraining ourselves to go okay yes that feeling that i have when i shame myself but then i at least do something about it mm -hmm. that's familiar and now I'm yeah. going to create a new familiar mm -hmm. and that takes mm -hmm. time and that takes a lot of practice because your body will always go 
to the familiar first, but that's not wrong. That also isn't wrong. That is just Mm -hmm. how it is. That's just how Mm -hmm. we are built. And so anytime you find yourself doing it, which you will, you might do it great one moment and then the next one you're like, (laughs) here I go again. It makes perfect sense. Tell yourself that. Use that line. I use it with myself. It This makes perfect sense why this is happening. Yeah. My stomach's yes, grumbling because grumbling I haven't eaten in four hours. That makes perfect yeah. sense. Yeah. I am mad at myself because I can't make a decision because that state, all the changes that are happening in my body when I feel that way is a very familiar place to be. Mm. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Mm. I feel like I need that tattooed on my arm. I know. So I can just like read it. That makes, makes perfect sense. sense. <laughs> what you're feeling. Makes- <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, I, I sometimes love to do this. I don't know if it feels applicable to this conversation, but, you know, sometimes it's fun to give like a live example of maybe like, so let's say that um, a NICU mom is out of the NICU and um, they're having to make a decision about preschool. And they're feeling completely tapped. They're like, oh my gosh, preschool means germs. Preschool means, or daycare even. And you're beating yourself up because you're like, oh, actually, it's been years since this, you know, since the NICU. Like, you should be over it by now. You know, so if a mom is struggling with a decision like that, what are, you know, how can she, maybe it is like that this makes sense, but how can she work through that decision maybe like one sentence or line of narrative that she can use to empower her to make that decision. Yeah. I think it start it starts with it does start with that compassion. It really mm-hmm. does. How mm-hmm. does this make sense given what I've been through? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Cuz we yeah. add on, I think with especially with NICU moms and NICU parents, we add on the fact that daycare is often the next time that the child is in the care mm-hmm. of somebody else. And that's going to yep. bring up yep. all kinds of somatic memories that we think we are yes. technically over, quotes, in the air. And mm-hmm. we're not because our body hasn't forgotten. So yeah. how is this decision that's feeling impossible to me, how does it make sense that it's feeling impossible to me? Like really drill that into yourself. Because what yeah. that does is it takes that shame away. That judgment, the self-blame, the like, why can't I just do this? Why is this so hard? This person over there sends all her kids since they're three months old to daycare. Why can't I do it? All that gets erased when we can hear that compelling argument, this makes perfect sense that this is difficult for me, right? Yeah. And then from there, we have to remember and this is, this is the one thing I say that people don't like to hear. <laughs> we don't actually make decisions from our head. Mm-hmm. I say this as a self-proclaimed lover of pro-con lists. I have yeah. pro-con <laughs> lists for absolutely everything. That is not how we make decisions. We will mm-hmm. make decisions based on the state our body is in at that time. Mm-hmm. And that inc- mm-hmm. that's a threat state, yes, of course. But that's also affected by... How much sleep did we get? Are we hydrated? Are we well nourished? Do we have a support system, which I know is missing for a lot of people right now? Do Mm -hmm. we feel like we have our basic needs met? Mm -hmm. Right? So those decisions are going to be made based off of that threat state that we're in. So if it's being hard to make the decision, I say toddler it and go, are you hungry? Are you sleepy? Mm. Do you need some hugs? You know, we do this for our kids. It's time we do it for ourselves too. What do we need right now? It always goes back to that question, right? And if you can't hear it, right? Because I know, Aisha, you mentioned it's hard. We can't Mm -hmm. hear it. That's part of threat physiology. We're not supposed to hear that when we're in an active threat state. So it's a good opportunity to ask somebody who knows you very well. When I get yeah. this way, what do you think usually helps? What has helped in the past? Yeah. Yeah. Or what has yeah. not helped? Don't do that. <laughs> <Yeah. Uh-huh. laughs> right. And remind yourself that unlike the NICU, we have much more time to make these mm. decisions. And even in the NICU, barring very small and specific circumstances, we have time then too. Even if it's an emergency, you have a few minutes to make that decision. Mm-hmm. So here now, when you're on the other side of the NICU, stretch out that time. How much time do you actually have, right? Mm -hmm. And it's often longer than we've created it in our heads yeah. because it all feels so tight and urgent and it must happen right now. Yes. That's the threat state responding. 
right? Yeah. So you want to get into those those situations where you're well cared for and you understand why this decision is so much more complex and nuanced for you than it might be for somebody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you do those two things and a lot gets clearer because there are so many decisions then or options that are just automatically moved off the table because they're not mm-hmm. options yeah. for you actually. And so you don't need yeah. to consider them anymore, right? Mm. So it sounds like you're telling us that we need to slow down a little. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? You mean adding coffee doesn't help? <laughs> Espresso oh would be goodness. better. <laughs> I love that. It's just you're speaking and it's resonating. And now I see this in a different light. It just makes me excited for Ruvel. It makes me excited for like, <laughs> just this conversation yeah. because, you know, what they say, like, knowledge is power and once you have access to this kind of information and this knowledge mm-hmm. it can be it can be life altering Aisha I love seeing you experience this for the first time oh, because yeah. this was me and Martha every time we were like oh like how do I not make this about me right now because I have like right. 10 questions mm-hmm. geared up to be like so no, this one time um but I know Oh, I know. Well, I just think of, you know, we talk a lot in the Facebook group and I've talked with other working moms who this just like frustration that we all have of like, I mean, I, I know she'd be okay with me sharing this, but Martha and I have talked a lot about like prior to our NICU experiences, we were so the people at work freaking loved us because we were the quickest decision makers. We got stuff done. If anything was complicated, we can make it simple in an instant. And now after all of these experiences, we just find ourselves so frustrated that we can't maintain the pace that we could prior to our trauma. And at the same time, I would never look at Martha and shame her for that, but I do that to myself. Mm -hmm. And so throughout this episode, I'm just thinking specifically a little bit about some of our, um, our NICU moms that went back to work, whether in the NICU or after the NICU and find themselves really wrestling with like, am I still a competent like coworker here in this space? Because I can't freaking write this email like chat GBT take over because I can't <laughs> type this out. So, you know, for those moms listening that are kind of wrestling with this new identity and like pace of decision in this season, like what encouragement would you offer them as they kind of, navigate this new pace of decision making yeah i think what i'll start by saying is it's not you you inherently as you have not changed you are still you you're still in there and that has not changed a lot of things about us do change a lot of our world views change a lot of what we know changes after we go through what we do in the nicu certainly but you as the core of who you are has not changed What your body is telling you right now is you need something different than you did before. And I think generally speaking, we have this idea that we are static beings. Once we hit adulthood Mm -hmm. and all the madness of adolescence is gone, this is who we are until we get old. And I think what we miss is the nuance of almost every, what, seven to 10 years, if not sooner, our bodies are changing, our needs are changing. And then you add little people into the world and those needs are changing and who we are changes, you are still that competent decision maker who can make decisions on the fly. You are still so smart and so intelligent and so bright and so good at what you do and the world needs your light. All of that is true and, and your body needs something different right now. Yeah. And I fully realize that when we live in this kind of capitalistic world where we live Mm -hmm. in a place where you got to fit into that box and okay you know maternity leaves over get right back to Mm -hmm. it it doesn't really work the same way you know those genes don't necessarily fit the same as they did Mm -hmm. before and so we get to then say if I have to be in that box especially for work for financial stability and all of that what do I need in order to fit there right now And then you get to also ask the question, do I have to fit there in that way? Are there Mm -hmm. conversations that I can have with my employer where we can make some Mm -hmm. adjustments? I think a lot has changed in the last few years that we thought would never change in those ways. But ultimately, it's not you. 
You're not yeah. broken. There's nothing wrong with you. Nothing's failing. You're not failing. Mm -hmm. You just need something different right now. And it yeah. doesn't have to be forever. Yeah. Hmm. I love that. And I love the grace that you are allowing in that too. I think that that was a very important point for me in listening to you is just it's not going to be perfect from the get-go. There's going to be setbacks and there's going to be days where you are great at it and there's going to be days where you struggle more. And it's just that that grace to to be human, to be you cuz we are we have flaws and faults and we're dealing with a lot and so I I just love this this um this narrative of not like put pressure on ourselves to do it perfectly it's not a race this is our lives right i always want to take a nap after these episodes <laughs> <laughs> like oh okay um well and maybe as we kind of near the close here of this episode i i feel like i've i've heard you hint a little bit throughout when you share about this that you won't you won't always and you don't always have to operate out of a threat state mm -hmm. that there is a a world or life ahead where you can connect with yourself again and so i always love asking you because it's always so affirming but parja is it possible <laughs> is it possible after everything that we've gone through to connect with ourselves again and to find ourselves we may never be at the same decision making pace that we were prior to becoming a parent or through our trauma but is it possible to reconnect with ourselves after what we've gone through yes yes wholeheartedly mm -hmm. completely yes it is threat states are meant to be temporary and mm -hmm. while our world and our society and what we've been through has kept us there longer than we are supposed to be air quotes mm -hmm. supposed to be but with you know our physiology supposed to be your body is constantly trying to complete those threat cycles to come out of it and it's coming out through these symptoms, quote unquote symptoms, that we tend to shame ourselves for or blame ourselves mm -hmm. for. That is just mm -hmm. your body trying to go, hey, let's finish this cycle that got stuck mm -hmm. months or years ago. Let's complete these cycles so we can get back to our baseline, whatever that baseline looks like. And again, that baseline will change just as we get older, just, just based mm -hmm. on that alone right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. yes, yes, it is possible. It's not just possible, it's probable. Your body mm -hmm. is trying to make that happen right now. And we move away from the, the blaming and the judgment and the why can't I, and I'm a failure and I'm broken. And oh my gosh, all the things I have said to myself too. We take that away and we go, how does this make sense? What does my body need? How can I give that to myself or get that for myself? And yes, that is even when you're in really difficult circumstances, your body is always looking to complete those threat cycles. You do not have to live like this forever. You probably will not live like this forever <laughs> if you're able to complete those cycles. And my God, I wish I could bottle up what it looks like <laughs> when my clients get there. Like, mm -hmm. it's like you are a different person except you've gone back home is what you've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. is possible for everybody. I fully, fully, fully believe that. And cue the tears. There's always one point in the episode where I'm like, I was holding it together for a lot of that. But that right there is just the hope that I hope yeah. we take away from this episode yeah. is, A, we acknowledge that this isn't our fault, that we're not broken. This isn't like a life sentence of like, now you will forever live in threat state, mm -hmm. as sometimes Instagram will tell us. <laughs> Um, but, that, <laughs> but that there is, um, it is possible mm -hmm. and that there is, there is hope that, that you will find home within yourself again and that you're worthy of it. Um, so Nikki Mama, rewind and listen to that past five minutes as many times as you need to bookmark it on iTunes. Put it on your arm in a tattoo form if you need to. I might write it out on my mirror when I'm getting ready in the morning or on my background, on my screensaver, whatever you need to do to really affirm that there is hope, that what it makes sense considering what you have gone through, and but that there is also hope on the other side. And so 
as we kind of near the close, I'd love to know who is Ruvel for? Is it just for moms that want to get pregnant again after NICU? Is it for moms that find themselves navigating this? You know, who is Ruvel for? And um, what does connecting with Ruvel look like for those who subscribe? Yeah, Ruvel is for, it's for everyone. It's for mm-hmm. if you're trying to conceive, if you're going through fertility treatment, if you're going through a high-risk pregnancy, if you're in the NICU, if you're at home after all of that, after loss, after birth trauma, after medical trauma, we're the place to come to when your path doesn't look like what it was quote unquote supposed to. Mm-hmm. When what to expect doesn't work for you, you come to Ruvel. That's that's yeah. what we're here for. And you know, you can connect with us in whatever capacity you have. So mm-hmm. if you want to get to know us, join our Perks membership, and then you'll get these emails that inspired this podcast episode. You get access to promos in our shop and all of that. If you want to go a little bit deeper, then, you know, grab something from our shop. We've got journals, we've got books, we've got a bunch of other stuff in there um, that give you tasters of what kind of support we provide and if you're ready for the big leagues then and it's not really that big don't feel overwhelmed it's it's as in (laughs) if you want the warm welcome in deeper (laughs) then uh, come and join our private members club and in there you'll get the foundational work that we start all clients with you'll get access to all of it it'll be everything from master classes to quick win classes to lives where you can bring your questions Um, One of my favorite places in there is the somatic meditation room where you get to actually practice real somatic practices and see how Mm -hmm. slow and gentle they actually are. So you get used to being back in your body again Mm -hmm. before we start completing those threat cycles because we want to do this very gently. I think one of the Mm -hmm. things a lot of people do um, that teach incorrectly is they go too fast and we don't want to do that. That's not how it works. So We've got uh, mixers in our gathering place. So if you really, if you're missing that community, we've got it, you know, people who understand Mm -hmm. and so much more. I could go on about that, but that's just (laughs) the best way to do it is come on our Perks members, become a Perks member, check it out, and then come in as close as you have the capacity for. And we'd love to have you. Mm. So exciting. So cool. I'm so proud of you. I love this. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, what a, I mean, can you imagine just what a resource like that I'm sure you that's why you started it because you could have you could imagine it but like what how this could have changed so much had it been around 20 years ago I mean I just how remarkable that it's a resource now and available Mm -hmm. and I'm just so jazzed (laughs) just so excited about it thank you yeah it's it's gonna be such a wonderful I mean I commend you for taking your story and your experience and making something so beautiful out of it and seeing a need Mm -hmm. and going and filling it that is takes tremendous amount of courage and also just love and I I just see that in you I mean it's my first time meeting you and I it just it (laughs) really does radiate from you um your desire to to help and make a difference and so super grateful to have had this opportunity to learn from you (laughs) i feel like am i i feel like i'm maybe glowing like it's kind of rubbing off on me (laughs) Um, but it has been so awesome to to just get to have this conversation and like ashley like you said it was definitely a light bulb moment and Mm -hmm. i will be i'm re-listening to this episode (laughs) <laughs> quite a few times for sure yeah gonna download this one yeah um well parja do you want to chat about like kind of what the dear nikimama community can do to access it today? yes okay. so one of the I'm, i was like when can we talk about this yeah <laughs> um no one of the one of the most exciting things i think about the Bruvel and our private members club especially is that we really want to be that one-stop shop for people who are mm-hmm. on the complicated family building journey. And I know Ashley and I spoke about multiple times how frustrating it is when you're going through all this and then you're like going through Google trying to pick and choose and <laughs> curate mm-hmm. your support system mm-hmm. and how hard that is. And yeah. so we've decided to put everything under our umbrella. And what we're doing is partnering with Dear Nikki Mama because you all are so freaking amazing and we love you to death 
Um, and you all are changing the world in a way that has been so needed. And I wished had been there when I had been through the NICU as well. So we're partnering together. So in, uh, I believe, July, we are featuring Dear NICU Mama in our private members club. We're going to be highlighting the work that you do. We've got a fireside chat that's going to be coming where you get to learn a lot more about not only what you do, but how you're changing the world, how you can help <laughs> um, and be a part of Dear NICU Mama. And as part of the Dear NICU Mama community, you all get a special promo code to come into our community to support <laughs> and get together. and. We're going to have a blast together, and I'm so thrilled to be highlighting you all uh, into our community as well. We're so honored and excited. When you when you said that um, you were launching Revel and that like a partnership would be possible, I was like, when and where? Sign us up. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. Um, let's make this as accessible for moms as possible. I want as many moms as possible to be able to connect with what you're doing and just so honored to be able to collaborate. So we will make sure all of the ways to connect with Ravel will be in the show notes and we'll make sure to have that code in there and how you can connect with Ravel and the collaboration that we have coming up in July. But this is going to be such a beautiful resource for moms and in our community. And so thank you again, Parja, for what you do. And I'm so excited for this next venture for you. And it's just always such a joy and an honor to have you on the podcast and to our moms listening who have had that quote light bulb moment or feel the glow after listening to this episode. Um, we just hope that no matter what you just have, have heard that you're not broken, that there is hope. And like our, one of our recent collections says there is goodness ahead mm -hmm. that it won't always feel this way mm -hmm. and that there is hope. And there are resources like Ravel and Dear Nikki Roma that exist to help you navigate this. You don't have to do this alone. Mm -hmm. And so, um, listen to this episode as many times as you need to. I'm quite serious. I might make it my background on <laughs> my computer so that when I can't send an email or make a decision about supper or whatever, or, you know, we have kindergarten coming up and I'm like, holy cow, all of that stuff that it's just a reminder that it's okay to slow down and ask yourself what you need mm -hmm. and you're worthy of that time and that care. And so yeah. Parja, thank you. It's been such a joy to have you here and mama's all of the ways to connect with Ravel will be linked in the show notes. So please take advantage of those, but we appreciate you so much and we hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Thank you so much for listening to the Dear NICU Mama podcast. If you loved this episode, we'd be so grateful for a review. For more ways to connect with the Dear NICU Mama sisterhood, check out the links in the episode description. 